Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Today, we are building off of our coverage from the AI action plan last week. Obviously, a lot of that plan focused on China, and subsequently, China released their own plan. And so today, we are looking into the follow-up and asking more broadly, is cooperation or anything less than outright competition even possible? Now, by way of reminder, last week, we got the White House's AI action plan. As described by former VC and action plan leader Sriram Krishnan, the three core themes of the document were to accelerate AI innovation, build American AI infrastructure, and lead in international AI diplomacy and security. There was a lot that I found very interesting about this report. Most specifically, the fact that in many ways, it kind of runs counter to the general approach to foreign policy, at least the stated approach to foreign policy of this White House. Politico's Daniela Cheslow, who is actually an old classmate of mine from Northwestern, captured this pretty succinctly when she wrote, is AI the exception to America first? She writes, the AI action plan that President Donald Trump rolled out last week contained quite an Easter egg for globalists. She says that while in many ways the tone and posture was in line with Trump's previous foreign policy, that in point of fact, or as she wrote, packed into the AI plan's pages, was a pivot, a call to forge an enduring global alliance on the technology. She continues, the plan gets pretty specific. It calls for the state and commerce departments to leverage the U.S. position in international bodies. It names the United Nations, the OECD, G7, G20, and the International Telecommunication Union, among others, to advocate standards and governance approaches that reflect American values. So wait, did AI just carve out its own exception to America first? And what does that mean for America's increasingly fragile relationship with Western allies? Now, another place where I noticed this was in the section about open source and open weight AI. The action plan writes, we need to ensure America has leading open models founded on American values. Open source and open weight models could become global standards in some areas of business and in academic research worldwide. For that reason, they have geostrategic value. While the decision of whether and how to release an open or closed model is fundamentally up to the developer, the federal government should create a supportive environment for open models. Put another way, the White House is here declaring that open source AI models are a tool of diplomacy. Now, as I mentioned in my initial discussion of the AI action plan, this has the potential to run at odds with how some people have thought about open source models, particularly vis-a-vis China. If you were looking at the hardline stance that many were taking in 2023 when it came to China, there was a concern that releasing open source or open weight models would allow China to catch up. Now, of course, subsequent to that, China has basically caught up. They've been nipping at our heels just a few months behind. And when it comes to open models, they have screamed ahead. Point being that now when we are discussing the potential of open source models and open weight models as a geopolitical tool, it's in the context of China leading that particular part of the AI race. Overall, the response to the AI action plan was pretty divided, or rather, it mapped pretty exactly to the groups that were receiving it. The tech community by and large received it incredibly well. Box's Aaron Levy writes, America's AI action plan is quite strong. It has a clear mission to win the AI race and accelerate the development and use of AI by removing roadblocks or aiding adoption. Importantly, it focuses on the positive benefits of AI, which we're all seeing every day. On the flip side, New York Times reporting largely focused on what wasn't there, specifically questions of copyright. Professor Kevin Bryan writes, Come on, man, there's no way you can read that AI action plan and think that this is the first order thing New York Times readers should know about it. AI has huge implications for the national economy, defense, future of science, but half this article is about copyright. Now, it wasn't all divisive. Shaquille Hashim, editor at Transformer, writes, Most coverage of the AI action plan has been very negative. In Transformer, I make the case that it's actually not bad. Shaquille writes, Almost everyone I've spoken to this week has expressed some pleasant surprise with what the White House put together. Brad Carson of Americans for Responsible Innovation told me it was cautiously promising. Michael Kleinman of the Future of Life Institute said certain aspects were a, quote, step in the right direction. Brendan Steinhauser of the Alliance for Secure AI said he was pretty happy with a lot of it. White House AI czar David Sachs even pointed out the surprise endorsement of the Washington Post, who wrote an opinion piece, Trump is off to a good start with an AI action plan. So this was the context coming into China's release of their own version of this plan. The policy was published as part of the World AI Conference in Shanghai last weekend. The event is one of the most prominent tech conferences on the Chinese calendar. Chinese Premier Li Chung gave a keynote address at the event stating, Currently, key resources and capabilities are concentrated in a few countries and a few enterprises. If we engage in technological monopoly, controls, and restrictions, AI will become an exclusive game for a small number of countries and enterprises. 
He made the pledge that China is, quote, willing to share our development experience and technological products to help countries around the world, especially those in the global south, strengthen their capacity building and bring the benefit of AI to the world. The central pillar of China's AI action plan is establishing the World AI Cooperation Organization. The international group is envisioned to deal with issues of AI governance, regulation, and deployment. Think United Nations for AI, only headquartered in Shanghai instead of New York. And really, the rest of the action plan is similarly focused on global consensus. It calls on the world to follow through with existing UN agreements about digital technology, stating, Only by working together can we fully tap the potential of artificial intelligence while ensuring the security, reliability, controllability, and fairness of its development. The document features the word cooperation 13 times across 13 key priorities, just to give you a sense of the theme. The entire plan is also steeped in the language of AI safety and calls for global coordination on issues ranging from copyright to AI misuse. George Chen, partner at the Asia Group and co-chair of their digital practice, said, The two camps are now being formed. China clearly wants to stick to the multilateral approach while the U.S. wants to build its own camp, very much targeting the rise of China in the field of AI. I actually think that this is not necessarily correct. I think that China very much wants a unilateral approach, just with itself at the center of a multinational coalition all using China's technology. In fact, I think the Chinese plan has overtones of a digital Belt and Road initiative. The strategy is quite clearly to offer Chinese AI broadly and cheaply across the developing world. And this, of course, starts to inform how we can think about the indications that the White House might be thinking differently about this particular set of policies. Now, interestingly, in the wake of this, even around the very small amount of cooperation the U.S. is offering China on AI, there are some serious concerns. One of the big announcements from last week was that export controls on NVIDIA's H20 chips had been removed, and the chips could once again flood into China. The administration had basically started to adopt Jensen Huang's view that China is going to have AI data centers one way or another, so it's in the U.S.'s interest to have them using NVIDIA rather than Huawei chips. And demand seems absolutely off the scales. Reuters sources said that NVIDIA had placed orders for 300,000 units with TSMC to deal with demand in excess of their existing stockpile of around 600 to 700,000 chips. NVIDIA sold around a million H20 chips last year, so they appear to be gearing up to do at least that much business again as quickly as possible. And yet, Jensen's take is not the only one that's going around Washington right now. A group of 20 national security experts and former government officials wrote to Commerce Secretary Howard Lutnick on Monday urging the administration to reverse this decision. They called the decision a strategic misstep that will have detrimental effects on America's AI edge in both civilian and military applications. The letter stated, The H-20 is a potent accelerator of China's frontier AI capabilities, not an outdated AI chip. Designed specifically to work around export control thresholds, the H-20 is optimized for inference, the process responsible for the dramatic capabilities gains made by the latest generation of frontier AI reasoning models. For inference tasks, the H-20 outperforms even the H-100, an AI chip this administration has restricted access to due to its advanced capabilities. The letter also suggested that AI chips are currently a zero-sum game, with a surge in H-20 demand necessarily making U.S. chip shortages worse. It argued, the decision to ban H-20 exports earlier this year was the right one. We ask you to stand by that principle and continue blocking the sale of advanced AI chips to China as America works to maintain its technological edge. This is not a question of trade. It's a question of national security. It's a fairly diverse group of signatories, from Brad Carson, who leads Americans for Responsible Innovation, to former Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security Stuart Baker, to perpetual China antagonist and financial manager Kyle Bass. Now, trying to reflect on where this all suggests we are when it comes to this U.S.-China battle, I think that in some ways, it's a more fluid conversation now than it has been in the last couple of years. There are very clearly conflicting pushes and pulls, not only in the general political environment, but I would hazard a guess, even within White House officials themselves. There is an inherent tension between the foreign policy of withdrawal from the world and engaging full-throatedly in the global competition for AI that's laid out in this AI action plan. And like I said, I'm not sure that this represents a full 180 or a shift in the U.S.'s position, as much as a growing recognition that the landscape in which this competition is happening has changed. Foreign Affairs recently ran a piece called China's Overlooked AI Strategy that's all about how the release of these open models, like DeepSeek and others, is a soft power strategy to help Beijing gain global dominance when it comes to AI infrastructure. There's also just a very different disposition China has towards AI from a societal standpoint. The MIT Technology Review, for example, recently ran a piece called Chinese Universities Want Students to Use More AI, Not Less. Unlike the West, where universities are still agonizing over how students use AI in their work, top universities in China are going all in. The Washington Times recently wrote, Jarring moment. 
China's artificial intelligence gains bewilder top American researchers. And I think what's most notable here is that this is a publication with a very Washington Beltway type of audience. One thing that so far hasn't really been up for question is the assumption that China and the U.S. are in a great power struggle for supremacy in AI. And yet even that is now more up for grabs than it has been in the past. Law professor Peter Salab writes, The White House's AI action plan has some good stuff, but it begins the U.S. is in a race to achieve global dominance in AI. Like many, Simon Goldstein and I think that an AI arms race with China is a mistake. Our new paper lays out a novel game-theoretical approach to avoiding the race. The paper is called Collaboration at the Brink, International Law for the AI Arms Race. In the excerpt of the paper, they write, The centerpiece of our proposal is the formation of a joint AI lab that would combine the best U.S. and Chinese AI talent, supercharged by U.S. and Chinese national investment. We argue that, compared to either an AI race or a non-proliferation equilibrium, the joint lab would be both a safer and a faster route to AI development. They say that, in fact, AI safety advocates and AI accelerationists should endorse the joint lab approach. Now, I think this might be an interesting Long Read Sunday type of piece at some point, but the point for our purposes here is that this type of thing is starting to get into the ether. When Samuel Hammond agreed with Anthropic's call for the administration to maintain export controls on the H20 chip, based Beth Jezos wrote, it's not clear cut. Maybe we should host a discussion on GPU protectionism. He continued, open source models are a loss leader for AI labs to achieve market penetration. If China wins the open source race, then slowly migrates all models to only support Huawei, NVIDIA is cooked. And so is America's GPU supply soft power when it comes to AI. And this is why, although most of you are here for the business implications of AI and thinking about your own careers or your entrepreneurial endeavors and what AI is going to mean for your personal lives, I think it is important to keep track of this particular conflict. The things that happen right now in Washington and Shanghai and Beijing are going to impact more than just which AI models we have access to. Hopefully this was a useful primer that brings you up to speed with China's response to the AI action plan. For now, though, that is going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening, as always, and until next time, peace.